Hey everyone, I'm Stephanie. And I'm Sandy. And this is the Italian American Stories Podcast. Okay, well, we are back for part two of the family and life of Esther Albano. Yeah, it's going to be really crazy. We'll kind of recap our last episode just really quick. So Esther and her family came over from Sicily. They immigrated to New Orleans. They were able to open up a grocery store and two families. We had uh, Esther and her family. Her parents were Jerome and Josephine. And then there was Philip Pizzo. And the two families just had a lot of arguments and clashes and it sort of escalated and led to supposedly Josephine killing Philip in the kitchen of their house. (laughs) Somebody killed him. Somebody killed him. The captain thinks it was Jerome and her brothers, but uh, regardless, we kind of left off where um, a lot of the witnesses didn't come to the trial. And because of that, they couldn't hold him anymore. And all of the charges were dismissed and everybody went home free. So that's kind of where we left off. We also, you know, we we kind of set the stage talking about New Orleans, discrimination against Italian Americans. The lynchings happened a few years prior. And the Axeman, we talked about the Axeman setting the stage a little bit with that. And in this second part, he comes into play. Here we go. Here we go. All right. When we left off, it was December 1899 when everybody got released. During all of this chaos, Esther, she was only eight years old. So I'm sure that this was obviously a really stressful year for her and honestly, the whole family. That's a a lot to go through. I mean, that's months of waiting for the trial and I mean, somebody murdered in your home and all of that. So but after 1899, things seemed to settle down for the family for a while, at least. (laughs) So... In 1906, Esther, she was 16, and she married her first husband, Michael Pipitone. And together, they had six kids. And the couple, they also own a grocery store, just like her parents did. (laughs) Wow. Yeah. Um, And so the grocery store, I think that it was two levels. And and again, I think the family lived on the upper level, because when we get into another murder later, it kind of describes it as um, (laughs) as a two-level home. Not 100% sure on that, but I guess it doesn't really matter. So, you know, they own a grocery store. They they had their kids. They seemed to be going pretty good. But four years after their marriage in 1910, some strange events took place at the grocery store that they owned. In April of 1910, Michael's father, so this is Michael is Esther's husband. Michael's father, Peter, he was sitting in one of the bedrooms and he was looking out the window kind of down on the street and he sees another Italian walk by. And this Italian's name was Paul Di Cristina. When Peter sees Paul walk by, Peter, he raised a sawed off shotgun, pointed it out the window at Paul and fired, killing him instantly. Wow. Yeah. And so this is in, in the home that Esther lives in. It's like each home she lives in. There's some crazy stuff that goes down. (laughs) Paul, who was walking in the street, he was actually right in front of his home. He was getting ready to go in his own house when Peter shot and killed him. Paul's wife, he she summoned the authorities and told them that she thinks that the shots came from across the street. So this is all happening like very, very fast. You know, the police go to her house and she's like, my husband is dead. I think that the shots came from across the street. So the police go across the street, which is... Esther's and Mike's home and business, and they raid the grocery store, kind of start talking to everybody in the house and determine that Peter is the one that shot Paul and they take him into custody. Lots of names. Yeah. yeah. (laughs) Peter and Paul. Peter and Paul. I know. Peter kills Paul. It's like, what is happening here? (laughs) And so after they take Peter to the police station and they're interviewing him, and I don't think that this is the same captain from the first murder, he starts thinking that Peter's son, Mike, and remember, Mike is Esther's husband, was also involved in the murder and may have fired his own gun at Paul. So the captain goes back to the house, arrests Mike, and brings him down to the precinct. Wow. The coroner does verify that Paul was shot by two different guns. So there is a little, you know, he does have, Captain has some, a leg to stand on, basically, when it comes to this. But Peter, he insisted that Mike had nothing to do with it. And he said that, you know, I shot him. It was just me. Um, And even Esther said that, Mike didn't do it. We were sleeping in the, we were sleeping in bed. Like he was right next to me and we were both awakened at the same time by the gunshots. So, but this, this police captain is like, no, there were two guns that were shot. I think your son Mike did it. And Esther is covering for him. 
So wow. that's where we're at with this. The motive was, according to Peter, that uh, he used to lease a building to Paul, but Paul fell behind on his payments. And so Peter victed him from the building. And this started a feud between the two men. Makes sense. Yeah. Paul was mad that he got kicked out of this building. And I don't know if he was trying to, if he was living in the building or running his own business. But when Paul got kicked out of Peter's building, <laughs> he declared that he would open up his open up his own grocery store and take business away from Mike's grocery store. Mm-hmm. Um, so, you know, kind of started that, that fear of right. the families. And Peter also told the authorities that he would go to Paul's house to try and collect the back rent. But Paul would just beat him up and tell him not to come back again. And Paul is Mike's age. So, oh, and this is his dad. And this is an older guy that he's beating up. And the police did say that um, he did have bruises on him and there was evidence of beatings. So I don't, you know, it's hard to say. But Paul's widow, however, she had a different story. She said that they didn't fall behind on their payments, but their lease expired and they just didn't want to renew the lease. And this made Peter mad. So he said, she said, what do you, you know, right. it's like, how do you verify that? And I'm sure that there were a rental contract, probably, <laughs> you know, I mean, <laughs> you never know. But and so by the time the trial came in July of 1910, the captain didn't really have anything to hold Mike and bring murder charges against Mike. So he dropped all charges against Mike. And Peter was the only one that went on trial for killing Paul. So which makes sense. It makes sense. Yeah, because. You know, like I said, the coroner came back and said, no, there's two different bullets in Paul. And Peter said, yeah, I started with my shotgun and and then he went to a pistol. Oh, so he so, said that. He said okay. that. So on July 22nd, 1910, Peter was found guilty of murder and he was sentenced to 20 years in prison. It seems like the sentences back then were very low. Uh-huh. Because there was another episode we talked, I can't remember what the episode was, but we talked about how... Yeah, get six or seven years for killing. Exactly. It's uh, crazy. However, after five years of being in prison, Peter was released on parole. There you go. There we go. I know. It's like, that's, um, that feels like it, that would be a sentence for armed robbery today or something, you know, like it just not murder, not murder, a life, you know. So, of course, this caused a lot of issues. Peter and Mike and their family, they were getting a lot of death threats because Paul's family was not happy about this. Maybe Paul's friends. I don't know exactly who was giving the death threats, but and to be fair, I'm sure Paul's widow was probably really not happy about this. She was probably devastated. I mean, well, I'm sure to see it from both sides, however. But the threats, they were so bad that Peter's wife kept going to the police station and saying, like, look, they're going to kill us. And I don't know who she means by they. I'm assuming Paul's family. So it got so bad that the police, they actually helped out and they put two plainclothes police officers at the house for a while. Well, that's good. I know. That's kind of surprising. But things calmed down. And this is 1915 when Peter got out of prison. But I think after about a year, things calmed down and sort of went back to normal until the early morning of October 27th, 1919. Oh, so now we're in 1919. Now we're in 1919. So, yep, Peter got out of prison in 1915. There was a little bit of turmoil there. But four years later, on October 27th, 1919, Tragedy would strike again with his family. Curry. I know. <laughs> so around 1 a.m. that morning, Esther woke up because she heard her husband Mike crying out, oh my God, oh my God. And so she, you know, she just woke up. She can hear her husband crying out. She's not really sure what's happening. And so when she was able to turn on the lights, she saw that her husband was laying in bed. He was unconscious at this time and badly beaten in the head. And she said there was blood everywhere. And she was in the same bed? She was in the same bed. She was laying right next to him. So something happened to Mike here. She said their mattress was completely covered in blood. The walls and the ceilings were splattered with blood. And she even described the Virgin Mary that hung above their bed as being splattered and covered in blood. Wow. So whatever happened to Mike here was really bad. And Esther was right next to him. Just throwing that out there. (laughs) Kind of interesting. And so, you know... Once Esther took in the scene, she started screaming. I'm sure she was in shock at first. Like, what is, am I seeing this? Is this a nightmare? Like, what is that? And so she starts screaming so much that it woke up their 11-year-old daughter. And the daughter runs in the bedroom, unfortunately, and sees this scene as well. But then she just leaves and she just went outside to find help. 
And Esther, she opened their bedroom window and she started screaming for help also. There was a sheriff's deputy who was on his way home from work. So he's walking home probably from a really long shift and he hears all of this screaming. And so he runs over to Mike and Esther's house and he said that he found Mike mortally wounded in the bed and right next to the bed there was a weapon. And he described the weapon as being a large bolt with a nut attached to it. Could have been like off the railroad or something. Could have been, yep. Now, interestingly, there was a circus in town and this officer, his brain kind of immediately went to that. And he thought it could have also been a stake to anchor a tent down. Oh, so yeah, that's kind of interesting. And, and, you know, who knows? I mean, he might have spent the whole day at the circus, (laughs) you know, (laughs) patrolling the circus and that's where his brain went. And so when the deputy searched the home, he noted that the back door was open and the gate in the backyard was also left ajar. So it looked like, according to him, somebody went out the back door, left it open, opened the backyard gate and took off. So they rushed Mike to the hospital, but he did unfortunately die two hours later. And the authorities, they were able to rule out robbery because they found jewelry laying all around the bedroom and there was $100 in the kitchen. And $100, that's a lot of money. But remember Mike and Esther, they had a grocery store and apparently in this grocery store, they had a soda fountain. And so Esther told them the reason they had all of that cash laying in the kitchen was because all day long, they were serving people who were going to the circus. They would stop by and get a soda and then go to the go to the circus. So she said that they, they didn't even like they didn't even go to the circus because they were so busy at their grocery store. Right. So yeah. that was why they, all that money was in the kitchen. So the authorities were like, well, this is obviously not a robbery because... All of this stuff is here. But the police, they also noticed that Mike had defensive wounds on his hands and his arms. And they noticed that Mike, he had apparently started to put on his pants because they said like his pants were over his night trousers is what they called it in the newspaper. <laughs> um, but it, they weren't pulled up all the way. They think that he heard the the assailants coming in and was like, oh, what is that? I better go check. And was pulling up their pa- his pants to go look and then obviously was hit over the head with this weapon. And she's still asleep. And she's still asleep. Like she did, she never woke up until she heard him cry. Oh my God. And because of that, the authorities, they actually had a lot of questions and they were really confused about what happened because basically like what you just said, Esther was there the whole time. She was laying right next to him. It, so when the officers asked Esther about this, she said, quote, I sleep very heavily. I heard nothing until my husband screamed. I mean, I guess. I, you never know. Well, if it was a quick... Because she said she saw two men, right? Yes. So she did say that when she first got, like when she first heard him scream and she got up, she swore she saw two men leaving the bedroom. But the lights were off and she was like trying to figure out what was going on. I mean, spouses get out of bed to go to the bathroom in the middle of the night. You don't really wake up. And like you said, if they came in and hit Mike really quick over the head before he had time to scream, you know, I mean, I guess... There's that. It, it, it is odd, though. Like, I will give it to the officers. That is odd. <laughs> yeah. So because of this, Esther, she was initially a suspect. The thing that kind of got me was Mike had defensive wounds on his arms and his hands, which tells me there was a moment that he fought back. So I feel like that would have made a lot of noise. But who and movement and movement. Exactly. Like, because he was he was laying in the bed. So he fell back in the bed. Yeah, because he was sitting on the bed, putting on his pants, putting on his pants. So I, she is a heavy sleeper. She is a very heavy sleeper. <laughs> Another reason I think that they may have started suspecting her, and this is actually kind of just my own theory, was due to some unfortunate drama that the family encountered the month prior to Mike being killed. So he was killed in October, but on September 13th, so like one month before, Mike went outside to call in his son, Vincent, who was six years old at the time. So, you know, he goes outside and Vincent's probably playing in the yard and he's like, come in, it's time to eat or whatever. Well, Vincent didn't come. Vincent just kind of kept playing outside or doing whatever he was outside. So Mike got upset and he went out further into the yard and yelled like, get over here, Vincent. It's time to come in. So Vincent comes running up to him. And when Vincent got close, apparently Mike grabbed him. And according to three different witnesses, he threw the boy up in the air and let him just fall to the ground. Oh, wow. Yeah. So this is this is pretty bad. It Vincent immediately started screaming and didn't move or attempt to get up. So this is a pretty serious injury that the kid has. I'm sure. And Mike just walked back into the house. Esther, she heard all of the commotion and she could hear Vincent screaming. So she came running outside and she immediately scooped up her son and started walking, running to the corner to where she could catch a streetcar to go to the hospital. Well, no streetcar was coming 
I mean, you know, they don't, they're not always there. It's probably like 10 minutes in between or whatever. And for Esther in that moment, she's probably like, I need to get to the hospital right now. Like my kid is hurt. So she finds um, somebody driving a truck, flags them down and convinces them to take her to the hospital. And so once at the hospital, it was determined that this poor little boy, he had a broken leg, a fractured right hip and a massive contusion to his head. Good grief. That's pretty bad. And an investigation was launched, of course, by the police and by the Society for the Prevention of Cruelty to Children. So this is a lot. And this is just a month before. And like I said, this is just my theory. I'm not even sure if I believe it, but this could have been another motive for why or another um, another reason why the police thought Esther may have murdered her husband early on. Yeah. If she didn't trust him. and her, I don't know. Uh, yeah. And it kind of makes me wonder, you know, was this the first time he lashed out at the kids or was he always abusive and she had right. is he abusive to all of them all of them yeah and like this one was obviously a huge injury that that he caused and then did she ha- you know was she done and she felt like she needed to protect her kids i don't know it, like i said that's completely my theory um and i'm not even sure if i believe that you know believe that theory it's just they obviously had her as a suspect for a reason at the beginning Uh, oh and the other thing too was um she didn't have like blood splatter on her oh and blood was everywhere blood was everywhere but the main theory that the police had was that this was a revenge killing they believed that this was done to get back at mike's father who nine years prior had killed paul all and was released in five years they released in five years this theory kind of makes sense however the police and a lot of the citizens in new orleans couldn't help but wonder if Mike was another victim of the Axeman. We've talked about the Axeman quite a bit, but let's get into a little bit more details about what this serial killer was doing. So starting in May of 1918, the citizens and primarily the Italian citizens of New Orleans were becoming aware that there was a really dangerous man out there basically hunting them. Essentially, like we said, there's a serial killer in the area and there's the whole grocery store connection. Even the victims of the Axeman that were Italian Americans owned a grocery store. Yeah, that is so bizarre. It's so bizarre. And thinking about this time frame in America, this guy was targeting Italian-Americans for a reason, and specifically Italian immigrants who probably didn't speak a whole lot of English, didn't trust the authorities at this time for reasons that are just. Maybe he looked at them as an easy target. Like, oh, the police won't really care. Yeah, there There won't be much. much investigation. Exactly. I don't know, but there was definitely a reason why he was targeting Italian immigrants and grocery store owners. And mom brought up a good point earlier. You were talking about how maybe it was easy, maybe easier to break into because most of the grocery stores were on the first level. I don't know. Yeah, it just doesn't really make any sense. I mean, I understand, you know, because that's how Italians were looked upon. Yeah. A lot of people didn't like them. Yeah. But what's the one with the grocery store? I know. That's a weird thing. It's just because in all of the Axeman's killing, nothing was ever stolen. So it wasn't like he was going through the grocery store and taking food and cash and stuff. He was just breaking in and killing people. Maybe he didn't like the Italian immigrants bettering themselves. True. That's a really good point. That could be a really, yeah, maybe maybe his family owned a grocery store and Whoa. they didn't make it. And then he was like, oh, these Italians are moving in and they're opening up all these grocery stores. That's a good point because closed one of his down. Or- yep. That's a really no, good point. It's hard to say. I just want to kind of briefly go over the Axeman's victims. We're not going to go into them in detail by any means, but just to kind of give you an idea of what this guy was doing. So his first victims were Joseph and Catherine Maggio, and he killed them on May 23rd, 1918. And the couple, they were asleep in their bedroom that was above the grocery store they owned. So he broke into the home. And what he would do a lot of the times is he would knock out the bottom frame of the door. So I don't like the, they must have been separated into the two and he would crawl through the bottom part of the door. I'm picturing those old doors where they have like a, a square on the top. Right. And then the middle and and then a square on the bottom. OK, that's what I'm picturing, too. They were put they were made into those three pieces. OK, not like our doors now is it's a mold type thing. And it's one solid piece. Right. Of so it's is what I'm easier. saying. So it's probably easier to bust out. Right. And it makes sense that he would bust the bottom one out because you could just crawl through it versus trying to climb over, you know, shattered mm-hmm. wood and stuff. So once he got into their bedroom, he slit both of their throats and hit them in the head with an axe. This is the one thing where the police were kind of wondering with Esther, because as we go through the axe man's victims, you'll see that he didn't leave anybody untouched. 
he would kill or at least attempt to kill everybody that was in the bedroom. He didn't even touch Esther. Oh, that's kind of a yeah. yeah. So keep that in mind. And so this first one, though, the first killing with the Maggios, when the police were kind of going through and looking at the crime scene, they noticed the killer had actually taken off his clothes and left him at the house and changed into some new clothes before fleeing. Wow. Yeah. Um, brave one. He was brave. And I don't know if he brought clothes or if he took Joseph Maggio's clothes. I have no idea. But again, the police ruled out robbery because. No money or jewelry was taken. So a little more than a month later, on June 27th, 1918, Louis Bessemer, and he is described as being an Italian Bessemer. They must have probably spelled his last name wrong. He owned a grocery store and him and his mistress, Harriet Lowe, <laughs> and they were sleeping in the quarters at the back of the store. And the next day they were discovered because, you know, the store wasn't opened. And so I think one of Louis's relatives came over and they found that Bessemer had been struck in the head with an axe right above his right temple. And Harriet was hit over the left ear. Surprisingly, and fortunately, they were both still alive. Wow. And the police, they didn't have any suspects. Nothing was taken from the house. But the news of Lewis having a mistress was almost a bigger deal in the newspapers than the attack itself. <laughs> <That's> so funny. <laughs> um, it's gossip, I guess. There you go. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> After the attack, one side of Harriet's face was partially paralyzed and she would go in it later on and have surgery to try and correct it. But unfortunately, she passed away right after this surgery. So, but before she passed, she told authorities that she thought it was Lewis who had attacked her. And the authorities, they believed her because they charged him with murder and he ended up serving nine months in prison before being acquitted. But he was attacked too. Exactly. That doesn't make any sense. His jury, when he was on trial for murder, they deliberated for 10 minutes. I would bet you anything. There was not one Italian American on that jury. <laughs> oh yeah i'm sure i'm sure but obviously i mean he was attacked too they were both found unconscious right that makes no sense makes no at sense. all at all yeah so luckily he didn't have to serve and they them. were both laying there for who knows how long exactly. he could have died also he could have yeah exactly yeah with his injury if they would have been maybe a couple more hours they could have passed away weird unless he was trying to murder suicide True. But that's a very odd way to go about it. Right. Yeah. <laughs> so five days later, Joseph Romano was attacked on August 10th. He was also a grocery store owner and he lived there with his two nieces. The nieces, who were not in the same room as him, they were awoken when they heard the attack. So Esther must be a very deep sleeper. <laughs> yeah. Everybody else wakes up. Everybody else wakes up. <laughs> so the nieces, they run into Joseph's room and they find found him badly injured. They said that they saw a man, just one man, fleeing through the window. But sadly, Joseph, he died two days later. And the girls, they were able to provide a brief description of the killer. They said that he was dark skinned, a heavy set man, and wore a dark suit and a slouched hat. So mm. at least they got something. Right. So on March 10th, 1919, the Axeman attacked Charles and... His wife, Rosie Cordomiglia. They were also grocery store owners. And the sad, really sad part about this is they had a two-year-old daughter, Mary, who was sleeping in the bed with them that night. Yeah. The next morning, a neighbor, his name was Lorlando Giordano. He heard screams coming from Charles' house. This is where I get a little confused because it's the next morning. So who was screaming? I think Lorlando heard either Charles, Rosie, or the baby Mary screaming. And so he runs in and he finds all of them attacked and hurt. And they were all rushed to the hospital. But sadly, the daughter passed away in the hospital. So uh -huh. now this gets a little crazy because Rosie, she actually, actually claims that they were attacked by Lorlando and Lorlando's son, Frank. And so this wasn't taken seriously at first because Lorlando was a 69-year-old man and he was in pretty poor health. And Frank Giordano, they said, was too big to have fit through the panel in the back door. Oh, so the, it was the panel again. It was the panel again. But a few days later, they did arrest the father and son. Charles, however, so that's Rosie's husband, he completely denied this. He said that he knows without a doubt that the father and son were not the attackers. But by this time, the police completely believed Rosie. And I think, honestly, they were just hoping to catch the axe man. They wanted to put somebody behind bars and say, look, we, we got him. It's done and over with. And they went forward with charges against the father and son. And a jury found the two guilty. And Frank was sentenced to Hain. And his father was sentenced to life in prison. And so Charles was completely dev devastated by this. Uh, he, he ended up divorcing Rosie. And then about a year after the 
two were sentenced. Rosie reversed her claim, stating that she had falsely accused the two of jeal- out of jealousy and spite. Like I said, I'm going to do episodes on all of these these victims. And so hopefully I can figure out kind of what happened. I did listen to another podcast that talked about this situation. And they talked about how they kind of think Rosie was the one that was screaming. And she had just woken up from being attacked. And the first person she saw was Lorlando. So she had a massive head injury. They think like she just immediately connected it to Lorlando. Oh, that makes that kind of makes sense. Either way, luckily, these two men were released from prison. So good grief. I know. It's crazy. It's absolutely crazy. But the axe man is taking everybody. Yes. Except for Esther. Except for Esther. And so I think that's kind of why the police are leaning more towards the revenge killing. Mm -hmm. So, but four days after Charles and Rosie and Mary were attacked, the Times Picune, which is a newspaper in New Orleans, received a letter from the axe man that promised another attack. And I'm actually going to read this letter. So it starts with hell, March 13th, 1919. So it's like the axe man is saying that this letter is coming from hell, I guess. And then he goes on to say, esteemed mortal of New Orleans, they have never caught me and they never will. They have never seen me for I am invisible, even as the ether that surrounds your earth. I am not a human being, but a spirit and a demon from the hottest hell. I am what you Orleanians and your foolish police call the axe man. When I see fit, I shall come and claim other victims. I alone know whom they shall be. I shall leave no clue except my bloody axe. Be smeared with blood and brains of he whom I have sent below to keep me company. So he's kind of referring to himself as like hell hell and devil. and Yeah, Yeah, he's the devil. He's the devil, yeah. If you wish, you may tell the police to be careful not to rile me. Of course, I am a reasonable spirit. I take no offense at the way they have conducted their investigations in the past. In fact, they have been so utterly stupid as not to only amuse me, but his satanic majesty, Francis Joseph, etc. Oh, no idea what he's saying here. But tell them to be aware. Let them not try to discover what I am. For it were better that they were never born than to incur the wrath of the axe man. I don't think there is any need of such a warning. For I feel sure the police will always dodge me as they have in the past. They are wise and know how to keep away from all harm. Undoubtedly, you Orleanians think of me as a most horrible murderer which I am, but I could be much worse if I wanted to. If I wished, I could pay a visit to your city every night. At will, I could slay thousands of your best citizens. And then in parentheses, he puts, and the worst. For I am in close relationship with the angel of death. Now, to be exact, at 1215, earthly time, on next Tuesday night, I am going to pass over New Orleans. In my infinite mercy, I am going to make a little proposition to you people. Here it is. I am very fond of jazz music. This is an insane letter. I am this man is crazy. This is yeah, exactly. I am very fond of jazz music, and I swear by all the devils in the nether regions that every person shall be spared in whose home a jazz band is in full swing at the time I have just mentioned. <laughs> if everyone has a jazz band going, well then so much the better for you people. One thing is certain, and that is that some of your people who do not jazz it out on that specific Tuesday night will get the axe. Well, as I am cold and crave the warmth of my native Tartarus, and it is about time I leave your earthly home, I will seize my discourse, hoping that thou wilt publish this, that it may go well with thee. I have been, am, and will be the worst spirit that ever existed, either in fact or realm of fancy, the axeman. Wow. Yeah, so he's basically demanding that the following Tuesday... All of New Orleans needs to play jazz music. At 12.15. At 12.15. If that was the time. I think, yeah, that was the time, 12.15. And the people of New Orleans obeyed. They said jazz music could be heard across the city. It was playing in homes, dance halls. People were playing in the streets. They, that's how scared they were. Well, you can't blame them. You can't blame them. I would, I'd put on a record. Absolutely. <laughs> like, repeat that all night, baby. <laughs> and no one was killed. Oh, wow. Yeah. So for several months after this letter and jazz night, there were no more attacks. But on August 10th, 1919, he did strike again and he killed another Italian grocer named Steve Boca. He killed him at night in his bedroom while he was sleeping. And how many months apart of this? The letter came in, I think, March. Yeah. So the letter went to August. He went till August and then he killed Steve 
And amazingly, oh no, I'm sorry, he did not kill Steve. Steve survived and ran to the home of his neighbor, Frank, and Frank called the authorities. But Steve, you know, he couldn't remember any details. He couldn't give an explanation. So, and then the Axeman kind of goes on another killing spree. So September 3rd, 1919, he kills a Sarah Lawman. She was attacked with an axe while she slept in her bed. Now, this one, I actually think is the only one that did not own a grocery store. She was just a single young woman living alone. So Steve, this previous one, a uh, grocery store. Steve, the previous one. Um, oh, okay. I must have missed that. Yeah, but Sarah, she she did not own a grocery store. So um, they found her laying in her bed. She also survived, and they found the bloody axe in her front yard. Wow. That was September 3rd, 1919. Then for a couple of weeks there, everything was pretty calm, no attacks, until we get to the attack of... Mike Pepitone, Esther's husband, on October 27th, 1919. Thinking back through all those victims that we just went through, I can kind of see why the authorities and the citizens tried to connect Mike's murder to the axe man. He was an Italian immigrant. He owned a grocery store. He was hit in his head at night when he was sleeping in his bed. Just not with an axe. Yeah, it wasn't an axe, though. And the only other thing, though, is he left Esther completely untouched. So... Right. You know, I can see that I can see the connections for sure. But I was also wondering the Sarah Lawman status in life was because if you go back to the, his letter. Yeah. Where he was saying the best and the worst or something. Yes. That kind of says like the top Italian, they're they're bettering themselves, owning a store. Yeah. And it would just be interesting to see. That's true. I'll look at it um, and look her up and see if we can. I can figure out. I just know that she was a single younger woman living on her own. So, you know, maybe he looked at that as like scandalous sort right. of. I mean, you know, we got to think this is 1919. And yeah, it's like, did he look at her as because he says the best people and the worst as the worst. So, yeah, so does maybe. he look at the Italian immigrants as the worst and the non-Italians that he killed as the best i don't who knows yeah who, i don't that letter is so wackadoo it's yeah like, good lord so you know the authorities they they didn't rule out that mike was killed by the axe man but it wasn't their top theory and after this after mike there was no more attacks or killings from the axe man he never killed again so in a lot of places you will see mike listed as the last victim of the axe man I personally but didn't, didn't get killed with the axe. He didn't get killed with an axe, and the axeman didn't touch Esther. Right, right, yeah. Um, there's a lot of there is a lot. So I feel like in those lists there should be an asterisk, like maybe, right? <laughs> you know, because, yeah. Who knows? I I kind of personally think that um, Mike was killed out of revenge. It was a vengeance killing. Yeah, I'm going that way too. Me too. I don't think it was Esther. I don't think that she killed him. And I can see the connection to the axe man for sure. Right. Yeah. There's a lot of connection. Italian, immigrant, grocer, all of that. Right. But there's just a lot of things that don't add up either. Yeah. So it's hard to say. Okay. So there is our second crazy incident in the life and family of Esther. <laughs> yeah, that was crazy and a lot. And a lot. Yep. And because of that, I think we're going to stop here for part two and we'll get into the less crazy and i personally think the craziest event that happens in esther's life so oh boy it's a good story it's it, very interesting it's very interesting and like i said i want to go through and do stories on all of the italian immigrant victims from the nice. man and you know bring them bring their stories out there for people to hear so yeah good job oh, thank you well we hope you enjoyed listening to the second part of the fascinating life and family of esther albano and we hope you come back to listen to the last part stay tuned, stay tuned. one more one more to go <laughs>